Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Eric Ruby. Welcome to the 17th annual Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Day at the State House. This meeting is coming to you on Zoom with the help and support of the Greater Boston Chapter of United Spinal Association. Welcome to my friends in the spinal cord injury community, those in chairs, their families, caregivers, legislators and their staff, researchers, rehabilitation specialists, press, and those interested in our humanitarian cause. In view of the spinal cord injury to Jacob Blake at the hands of police in Wisconsin, this may be an opportune time to remind our legislators that Massachusetts is at the forefront of a quest for the cure. The Massachusetts Thomas Kennedy SCI Trust Fund Bill is built on our humanitarian principles, cutting edge research, and emphasis on health care for all. Across the nation, September is Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month. Let us begin with a proclamation signed by Governor Baker. This will be followed by remarks from Senator Mark Pacheco of Taunton, who was instrumental in the passage of the original SCI Trust Fund Bill and the updated version, which has garnered increased funding. Following Senator Pichico, our five grant recipients will discuss their projects, how their funding is being spent, and the progress they are achieving. Their talks will be five minutes, followed by questions received in the chat box on Zoom. Okay, the proclamation is what I will be reading first. Whereas the estimated number of people living with spinal cord injuries in the United States is 294,000. Whereas every year, approximately 400 people sustain a non-fatal spinal cord injury in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Whereas spinal cord injury can occur as a result of motor vehicle accidents, violence, falls, sport, or occupational accidents. And whereas these injuries can cause a variety of disabilities ranging from quadriplegia to paraplegia. Whereas through public awareness, the Commonwealth seeks to minimize the devastating effects of spinal cord injuries. Now, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 to be Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Day and month, um, signed on the 1st of September and urge all citizens of the Commonwealth to take uh, cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance signed by Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, and William Galvin, Secretary of the Commonwealth. At the end of the program, I will be awarding the proclamation to deserving recipients within the spinal cord community. Senator Pacheco, uh, let me just begin by thanking you uh, so much, Dr. Ruby, for your leadership, for your 
inspiration uh, for all the work that you have done in bringing everybody in this uh, movement uh, together. Together, you have actually created uh, a significant movement here, and as a result of your efforts and going all the way back to uh, those first days uh, more than 17 years ago, uh, dealing with uh, developing legislation along with Representative Fagan at the time. Uh, now there are significant resources that are available uh, to put into research. And as uh, the vision, uh, you know, says uh, Massachusetts walks again. And that's what the, the goal is. And I wanna thank all of the researchers, all of the legislators that have been involved, people that have been involved and can see uh, that, that future that we all uh, hope uh, uh, to see achieved uh, someday uh, to uh, improve the lives uh, of, of so many uh, people. There is hope, uh, there's new research, and we're going to hear more about that uh, today. So I simply want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Rupi. It's been uh, a pleasure and an honor for me to play a, a small uh, role in ensuring that we can focus on this uh, a particular issue. It's just too bad we all can't be there together in person at the State House. Uh, but obviously, we know that that is because of another uh, health uh, crisis that we're all facing today. And <clears throat> we are doing the right thing. I wish that more people would be doing exactly uh, what we're doing here today. And that is. Uh, uh, social distancing and making sure that we can try to, uh, uh, you know, deal with this COVID-19 uh, emergency uh, the best way we can until we have the vaccine uh, and that, uh, you know, gets, gets us to a different place. Uh, my final comment is that uh, with the updated legislation that was passed and uh, we uh, did so in memory of uh, uh, an individual who I had the pleasure of serving with uh, for so many years, uh, you know, Tom Kennedy. And he was truly an inspiration to uh, the House of Representatives and to the Senate. He served in both bodies. And <clears throat> we knew, uh, those of us that thought about it for a second or two, knew that everything that we did to get to our meetings, well, it took Tom a lot longer uh, than any one of us that were not uh, in, his, uh, in his situation. And uh, for somebody that, um, you know, never complained uh, and, and uh, wanted to do what was right for people, and trying to uh, always try to improve the quality of life uh, for all people, uh, uh, we thought it would be appropriate to, uh, uh, to name uh, these provisions uh, after him. And so uh, just like so many that he represented in the, uh, in the chamber, uh, so many that are uh, with us uh, today, on this uh, Zoom call and for the work that is being done in research that will hopefully get us to a place where Massachusetts walks again. Uh, you know, we, we do that in, in the memory of so many people, certainly Thomas Kennedy, uh, one of them that just was an amazing uh, person. So thank you very much, Dr. Ruby, for your leadership. We look forward to getting a charge from you as to what we need to be doing next as we continue to uh, uh, fight and, and invest in uh, future research uh, to try to get us to a place where we're uh, able to uh, you know, do so many more things to uh, help people in this regard. 
So thank you very much for the, the few moments uh, to be with you all. And please uh, reach out to my office if there is anything I can do uh, to be helpful in the future. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Pacheco, uh, for those kind words. And yes, we are moving forward. Uh, our first uh, grant recipient is Dr. Jeff Macklis. Uh, he will be speaking to us about growth cone uh, molecular machinery for axon growth inhibition versus regeneration in spinal cord injury. Dr. Macklis. So I thought I would uh, just start off by seconding uh, Senator Pacheco's uh, thanks to Eric Ruby's uh, leadership in this. But I also want to, as I have in the past, uh, thank Senator Pacheco for his leadership in uh, knowing the levers uh, to be used to uh, bring to bear what I think all of us as awardees are going to agree is um, much more uh, enabling funding by this program than uh, for many years in the past. And I thought I would tell you just in the next four and a half minutes about how my lab and Anna Engman, a postdoc, and Manuel Peter, a postdoc in particular, are using uh, this enabling grant. And I'm going to talk about work uh, that is aimed in particular uh, toward the regeneration of corticospinal neurons, the neurons that connect, if you can see my cursor, uh, from the brain here in a particular region of the brain and send their long axons. I'll tell you more about that but not on this historic uh, drawing, all the way down the spinal cord where they connect to other neurons that go out to muscle and enable movement. And it's not that we think that's all of spinal cord injury, that's the cause of the paralysis, or as Dr. Ruby pointed out, either the quadriparasis or parasis in spinal cord injury. The sensory system send, send axons the other direction. We feel that, or not feel, this work that I'm going to tell you about briefly is relevant to rebuilding both systems, but I'm going to be focusing here. So uh, we're interested in these neurons. In this schematic, we see that these neurons as these round circles, their cell bodies, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, send their long axons all the way down the spinal cord. Now to most people here who are not basic scientists, um, that might seem very peculiar, or that might seem like there's a computer up here sending out a wire, but I'm gonna tell you that's not the point. So these neurons subserve really all voluntary movement. Here's what three of them look like. Here are their cell bodies. They're receiving dendrites here and here, and then their axon at this scale would send an axon roughly to the state house from my house. So that's quite remarkable. Um, but let me tell you just a little bit more about the problem with neurons and why spinal cord injury is so biologically complicated. We think about cells as being sort of round balls that have all of their molecular guts, the details don't matter. And then textbooks tell us that neurons have this same round ball cell body and then send out an elongated axon. But that's a totally false impression because really, if I put the cell body of a normal cell down to this tiny little size, this is a neuron, same size cell body, but its axon extends up and down, up and down, a thousand to a hundred thousand times as long as its cell body. And you might wonder why I'm sitting in the lower left corner. So if the cell body of a neuron that's connecting through the spinal cord was the size of my six foot one inch tall body, my arm would be the diameter of my axon. And that axon would extend from Boston all the way to Providence, Rhode Island to get to the lower spinal cord. That's one cell, that's astronomical. And the problem is, if there is a crush or a twist or a break or a cut up here in Braintree or in Mansfield or in Attleboro, 
we have different levels of spinal cord injury. And we know from the very person who named neurons and who discovered so much of what we now know back in the late 19th century, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, that neurons grow their long axons over time, over weeks and months, and those then turn into the so-called synapses that connect to the lower neurons that connect to muscle. The problem is Ramon y Cajal and his students also did experiments where they cut or crushed or damaged axons. And what happens is those growth cones don't regrow normally. They don't look like these growth cones that are wriggling through the body, through the nervous system. Rather, they look like these called so-called dysmorphic, bad morphology, um, end bulbs, retraction bulbs, and they don't grow. Why is that? So in my last couple of minutes, um, through the Mass Spinal Cord Injury Trust, and I'm so pleased to know that this is named uh, in, 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 in honor of Mr. Kennedy, that uh, Anna Engman, a very talented postdoc, is uh, using approaches my lab has pioneered over the last several years to now look in rodents. This is a mouse's brain, and the red are many, many thousands of those corticospinal axons. And we can now study them genetically, grab their tiny little growth cones, and find out essentially every molecule in those growth cones. This has never previously been possible and it's those growth cones that don't regenerate. So Anna is doing that work. And in addition, she's asking how does regeneration and what happens at the time of these non-regenerative dysmorphic growth cones. And we are planning with this grant to directly compare the developmental circuit building growth cones with the non-regenerative and with ones that we can force to regenerate in small number in the adult nervous system, in part thanks to work by Zhigang He's lab, who we'll hear from later. And finally, in the last minute or so, Anna Engman is also collaborating with Manuel Peter, another senior postdoc in the lab, to bring this more directly to bear on humans, because with supplementary additional parallel funding from the Travis Roy Foundation, we are now building human portions of cortex from uh, human uh, uh, approved stem cells and parts of spinal cord from human approved stem cells. And we can find that if we fuse those, they build circuits between them. And we've been able to study these and find out that they look like the right kinds of neurons, which means that we can now isolate those same growth cones, but from human neurons themselves that are corticospinal projecting neurons. And over the coming years, we are um, going to uh, apply these molecular approaches to identify the RNAs and proteins that are in those growth cones and identify what turns off during the post-developmental period. Because we know from many other studies in our lab that after the initial weeks and months of development, those growth cones turn non-growth able. And that we would like to direct our attention, not just turning on genes in cell bodies, but putting the right molecules where they need to function. And in my last slide, instead of showing you a whole acknowledgement slide, I've shown you the, the relevant folks. There's a lot that's been very simple in the spinal cord injury field, but wrong. And we're trying to take the complex, but we hope right approach, which has been long and tortuous, but we hope to bring it to bear to regenerating true functional circuitry from the cortex to the spinal cord and bring that to bear in humans along the way to activate the regrowth of human corticospinal neurons. So thank you very much for the, the time, Dr. Ruby and Jenny for organizing.
Thank you very much, Dr. Maklis. So I'm gonna to go to our second speaker right now, uh, who is um, uh, Dr. Ted Tang. Um, he is gonna speak on neural reconstruction uh, for functional repair of chronic SCI. Thank you, Dr. Rupi. Uh, I also want to uh, echo Jeff's uh, statement that uh, we as uh, investigators are profoundly grateful uh, for your leadership and for Senator Pacheco's uh, outstanding leadership uh, together uh, with all our members. Uh, we're making progresses and uh, we're meeting annually uh, to discuss them. It is uh, my great pleasure and privilege on behalf of my lab team to report to you about a strategy we're studying called neural reconstruction. And our focus has been on functional recovery for chronic spinal cord injury. I'll give you a bit of a background uh, how we got started. With the uh, previous funding, we were able to look into a very classic clinical spinal cord injury condition called brown cigar syndrome, initially described by Dr. Brown Cigar, a Mauritian physiologist and uh, clinician. In his 1850 paper, in which he systematically described a group of uh, Mauritian sugar cane field worker who suffered thoracolumbar lumbar spinal cord hemisection, which were caused by machete accidents. So uh, to his uh, surprise, instead of only seeing same side functional deficit, he actually saw the functional deficit were both sides. And uh, to make a long story short, on the same side, the individual will lose motor function, uh, which is also called the loss of a uh, upper motor neuron uh, input uh, due to corticospinal tract severance that uh, Jeff already touched on. In addition, this side also loses uh, some deep sensation uh, and also the joints and the body position, especially proprioception, which is a kind of a way body sense gravity to adjust our balance. The contralateral side shows impairment of a pain and temperature sensation loss. Obviously, this offered us a very good uh, enriched modeling system for which we tried to use uh, nerve reconstructions to study it. We published this paper about 10 years ago in which uh, nerve reconstruction is also called a nerve transfer uh, in clinical terms. So what it was doing was to borrow, to borrow a nerve that is, uh, it borrows a nerve above the injury level and also to sever it somewhere when it leaves the spinal cord. Then it picks up this uh, paralyzed nerve, which is below lesion level. In this model, which is the thoracolumbar injury that happened at thoracic 13 and the lumbar one interface in which what happened was that uh, we were able to suture these two nerves together and uh, use them for use them for nerve uh, reconstruction. With this reconstruction, what happened is the newly formed nerve, uh, as you see in panel A that nerve was able to refunction 
And uh, the idea is if you borrow a nerve above the lesion level, that may also let the spinal cord, the lower motor neuron, to exert control that would let the muscle reaction. And we indeed found that, but the results were beyond that because this result was not due to the regeneration as Jeff described in the normal physiology condition that the nerves can regenerate uh, during development. But in adulthood that descending degeneration uh, was not normally occurring. So with this little bit normal motor neuron we borrowed, but we saw this dramatic locomotion, the stepping improvement in these animals. So that suggests that somehow this borrowed nerves rekindled the locomotion pattern generation network in the spinal cord, in the lumbar, that is below the injury level and help the animals to step much better. The surgery was done one week after spinal cord injury and uh, the recovery was sustainable. So up to eight weeks after, we still see this, um, the column, the group in green, functional, uh, functioning much better than the open column, that is the control uh, with the sham surgery. Now we're uh, using the state's uh, newly uh, funded uh, grant to study that, can we study this in animals that actually suffered from contusion injury? And we use the same model. The reason for that is contusion injury itself does not really sever the whole spinal cord. They, there is some residual tissue. So we're stitching these two nerves together. And uh, we also did this study in chronically injured animals. There were eight weeks after spinal cord contusion at T13 and L1, in which we're now studying that not only what had been borrowed down as a motor control signal, we're studying what has been borrowed back as the arrow showing here, that, uh, that the sensory signal being able to go from the muscle all the way up back in the spinal cord, then to trigger intraspinal cord plasticity and to trigger uh, other neuromodulation fibers to regrow, uh, to influence the lumbar spinal cord. Thus, the legs can move again. So I want to thank the Commonwealth uh, for the grant support. And once again, I want to thank Dr. Eric Ruby and the Massachusetts Works again uh, for his and the organization's outstanding leadership. Um, my department chair, Dr. Defonti, has been always very supportive uh, and uh, very uh, visionary about STI research. And uh, the work was also collected uh, in uh, parallel, supported by grants from DOD, VA, and NIH. My fellows, uh, Dr. Konya, Dr. Zheng, Dr. Howard Choi, uh, and Dr. Yu were involved in the first uh, group of work. And uh, Dr. Rupert, Dr. Liao, and the Gandus and Wu, they're involved in the current work. Thank you very much. I have no disclosure to claim. So thank you very much. Uh, there were two questions that I wanted to uh, ask. Um, there was someone asked about, I wondered about long-term spinal nerve damage for incomplete paraplegia. And perhaps one of our researchers could address that. 
Sure, I'm, I'm happy to address that briefly. I know we're on a very short time schedule. The, there are a couple of really good questions wrapped into uh, that question. Uh, one is uh, sometimes in spinal cord injury, there's uh, damage to almost all of the fibers, uh, but there's even more loss of function because other fibers can lose their insulating myelin wrap, almost like the rubber around a wire, and those axons no longer function. It says if they're cut, and there are approaches being investigated by others to try to use those salvaged, maintained fibers um, and get them restored function, not by regenerating them, but by re-insulating them and letting them be functional. And a second very quick addition is sometimes fibers are traumatized. This might be what you're asking also. For example, some of the football players we've seen who get uh, uh, a bad tackle and they flip over upside down and they are paralyzed for a few weeks or days or even months and regain ability. And that's typically due not to actual crush damage severing, because that won't regenerate, but rather to essentially bruising and injury to those axons. And that can recover, which makes all human spinal cord injury clinical studies complicated because there can be immediate um, a restoration sometimes in those early days and weeks and even months. So that's a, a, a pretty quick answer, uh, Eric. I hope that does. Okay, well, thank you very much. I do want to mention, because it has been discussed about uh, the financial uh, issues, last year, because of the changes in our uh, funding mechanism, we did uh, garner um, $800,000 in one physical year. And this year, we were able to get $900,000. So we will be floating out more grants in the future. Um, uh, I want to go now to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Zigan He. Uh, from, um, he will be speaking on developing strategies uh, of promoting the anatomical regeneration and functional recovery uh, uh, of the reticulospinal axons after spinal cord injury. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my, my name is Shi Gang He uh, from Boston Children's Hospital. One of the, my uh, lab's focus is to develop new treatment for spinal cord injury. Uh, is with talent student and the postdoc and uh, tech support team. Uh, this is the image uh, of a uh, patient with spinal cord injury. In my lab, we apply uh, spinal cord injury in mice to model human patient. For both patient and the animal model, a common and a key pathology is the damage of axons. Those, uh, 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 yellow uh, fibers, nerve fibers, kind of like uh, cable lines uh, connecting brain and spinal cord. Uh, after the spinal cord injury, these nerve fibers dis are disrupted, then leading to functional deficit. So uh, uh, we have been asking uh, two in, uh, questions. One is how to promote axon regeneration. Second is uh, uh, how to enhance the function of regenerated axons. So uh, for the first question, in past the uh, decade, you know, our uh, lab has been focused on cortical spinal axons that is very nicely introduced by Jeff. So uh, you know, these neurons lo localized in the top of our brain, in the cortex, projected the whole uh, all way to the spinal cord. So uh, in both patient and uh, mouse model, if these axons get injured, they cannot regenerate. So in past decades, we, our lab, uh, developed uh, several strategies that could promote these axons to regrow, as illustrated on the right side. Uh, 
This is the wonderful example is from genetic deletion of P10. Uh, mechan mechanism is by activating mTOR pathway in these neurons. So similarly, uh, when we use a, a gene therapy approach by you know, deliver viral vector, that can achieve a similar level of uh, regeneration. Uh, for the second question uh, is uh, how to enhance the function of axons, either regenerated axons or the residue axons spelled from spinal cord injury. So this is a very important question because we know that most of spinal cord injury patients have some degree of spelled connections, but often those axons are not functional. So in past a few years, uh, we have developed a very severe but incomplete spinal cord injury in, in, in mouse. As you can see in this video, the high limbs are completely, almost completely paralyzed. So very excitingly, uh, in past few years, we developed uh, a treatment that this is by a compound called CLP290 that could uh, activate those spelled connections, allowed 80% of the paralyzed the mice to stand up, achieving some degree of uh, uh, stepping uh, function. So we were very excited by these uh, findings, uh, but as you can tell, you know, this uh, functional recovery is still limited. Now question is what else we can think about to further enhance the functional recovery. So it is known uh, cortical spinal axon, as Jeff and uh, I just mentioned, that's only the one of the cable line connecting brain and spinal cord. The other major line is called reticular spinal tract. Those axons started from brain stem in project to spinal cord. Up to now, very little is known about you know, this uh, axonal tract. So the objective in uh, our project is trying to find a way to promote regeneration of the reticular spinal axons. And also we, can, uh, we want to uh, you know, combine with other strategy to see if that can further enhance functional, uh, the function and to achieve better functional recovery. So uh, uh, despite COVID-19, we have made a lot of progress in the past year. Uh, in, in hopefully next, uh, next year meeting, uh, we'll have more time to discuss this uh, uh, progress. So in conclusion, I would like to acknowledge all of the people behind Massachusetts Walks Again, particularly Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Erica Ruby and Senator uh, Kiko and uh, everybody else. Uh, our research has been also uh, funded by other funding agencies, NIH, Adelson Foundation, Wings for Life Foundation, and the Travis Roy Foundation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. He. Uh, we don't have any questions. I wanna go right to Dr. Reisner, uh, who's gonna speak on uh, pilot testing uh, of systems for tight uh, blood pressure control um, uh, after acute spinal cord injury. Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, like the other uh, scientists presenting here, really express my, uh, my appreciation for that Massachusetts has this very special uh, avenue of support. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about our program um, and uh, what we're doing. Uh, and it's a bit of a change of pace. We've seen uh, uh, some really profound uh, neuroscience. Uh, our approach is far more clinical. Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, why blood pressure management is important after uh, spinal cord injury and the uh, associated clinical challenge. I'll tell you very briefly about our solution, uh, what we've done, and uh, what we're going to do um, in just the next few years. So uh, the key concept for folks who are not uh, uh, in the field is that a lot of times spinal cord injury is just partial and not uh, complete. And, you know, when this damaged spinal cord heals, that's when you get recovery of function. So some patients can have uh, one degree of disability right after the injury, and with healing, um, they get better, uh, partially or completely better. 
And conversely, uh, if that damaged cord can't, doesn't heal, uh, then you do end up with permanent disability. And arguably the most important factor uh, in healing is maintaining uh, persistently good nourishing blood flow to the damaged spinal cord, which can be very sensitive to even um, uh, uh, just a little bit of, of interruption of flow, and then you could actually uh, end up with permanent damage. Uh, spinal cord uh, injury, one of the issues is that you often get low blood pressure after a spinal cord injury, and that's because, uh, as uh, is shown in the cartoon here, um, along with uh, uh, interrupting the uh, nerves that control movement and sensation, you also interrupt nerves that go and uh, control what the blood vessels are doing and what the heart is doing, and the result is generally low blood pressure. And with low blood pressure, you get uh, low blood flow. And as we said in the prior slide, with poor blood flow, you can get worse healing and uh, worse long-term function. But luckily, this low blood pressure can be uh, very effectively treated with the right medications. So this leads us to what's the problem? Well, we want to maintain good blood flow, which means good blood pressure in the hours uh, and days after injury. And one key thing is that the spinal cord is really sensitive to uh, brief interruptions of this blood flow. The problem is that blood pressure is always changing through time, and there's a set of studies that show that really uh, clinicians just have trouble uh, giving their uh, patients with acute spinal cord injury just the right blood pressure management. Uh, this has been documented in ambulances, in emergency departments, and even surprisingly in specialized ICUs that are really there to provide very pristine blood pressure management. But even in published articles, there's just a failure. And it's not that clinicians are bad, but that it's actually a surprisingly hard problem because of just in, in uh, you might have multiple distractions, other patients through time, uh, fatigued, and all it takes is a brief lack of paying attention, or you might have a, a team that's just inexperienced and doesn't know how important it is to constantly stay on top of things. So we have proposed for our project an automated system, uh, and the goal is uh, basically perfect blood pressure management using today's technology. We have a sophisticated uh, architecture system, and the main point of this slide is that uh, you know, we interface with the patient's existing monitors, and then we're able to show uh, the output uh, both at the bedside or anywhere remotely. Uh, uh, and you know, this could, in principle, be show up on people's cell phones so that there's constant awareness. So our system is an automated system to watch the patient's blood pressure very carefully every second. And we have uh, essentially what's an AI uh, predictive algorithm that also looks at the patterns of blood pressure. And one of the key things here is it's we're really trying to differentiate between little fluctuations that are inevitable and, and can be ignored and the states where you really need the clinician to make an intervention. And then guiding the clinician, hey, you know, it's, it's really time that you take care of your patient to do something to keep that blood pressure right in the sweet spot. So um, the, uh, this program uh, is a sister program to uh, a generic system we have uh, for use in the ICU uh, in general, and we have received approval for investigational uh, testing of this uh, system in an, for ICU patients. And uh, as we speak, we're now developing additional specialized software functions uh, that will be used for patients in the emergency department. So. We don't want patients to have to wait four to eight to 12 hours uh, after injury before they get to an ICU where they can get perfect blood pressure management. And uh, we are on track to finish this by 2020. And then as part of our, of our currently funded uh, program, we want to do dedicated pilot testing, uh, what's called a feasibility study um, in acute spinal cord patients um, in the upcoming calendar year. After that, uh, you know, one of the advantages I think of this program is since we're really just using today's computer technology uh, and the, the, relatively speaking, the technical hurdles to the future are, are shorter. Uh, so we anticipate very uh, 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 aggressive and hopefully quick uh, progress. Once we've done the Massachusetts funded feasibility study, we want a larger multi-center trial that basically says, hey, this thing works in, in uh, sufficient numbers of patients. And uh, our intent is for this to be broadly available um, uh, by uh, uh, 
the year subsequent to that. Um, and so our, our, uh, what we intend to deliver is a solution so that any acute spinal cord patient gets perfect blood pressure management, whether it's right after uh, an ambulance ride, when they get to the emergency department and throughout the ICU stay. And through that, the, blood, the spinal cord will have uh, optimal blood flow and optimal healing conditions. And uh, studies in the past have shown that if you do that, you get uh, the best healing for your patients. Um, so I'd like to thank the uh, Massachusetts Spinal Cord Injury uh, Cure Research Program and uh, Massachusetts Walks Again, uh, Dr. Ruby, uh, for your leadership, Senator Pacheco. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the team who has helped us put this together. Um, and uh, uh, also, uh, we have a uh, industry sponsor for the sister project from the Nihon Koden Corporation as a conflict of uh, uh, interest disclosure. Um, so with that, uh, if there's any questions, otherwise I will pass it on to our next speaker. Well, actually there was a question and you answered it that ah. will be available um, as soon as possible and uh, being utilized hopefully in 2022 or 2023. Yeah, our, our intent is that, you know, that this, this is a, a, although it is hard uh, historically to, to really through time and everything else to make sure um, that patients get the perfect blood pressure management with, with today's technology capabilities this is a very applied project. We really want to make sure that, that, that we start a new chapter where, where there's never any uh, reduction in healing because of uh, anything less than perfect clinical management. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask uh, Christopher Gable to give his presentation on the modulation of cellular metabolism uh, to maximize neuronal regeneration. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Ruby, and to uh, Senator Pacheco and everybody uh, else involved in Massachusetts Walks again, and uh, to put together the day, uh, session today, which has been great, and I think it's just, uh, uh, sort of illustrates the great effort you've, you've put forward to really drive the research in uh, spinal cord injury therapies and nerve regeneration. I'm, I'm happy and honored to be a part of it. Um, as Dr. Ruby said, uh, we're interested in cellular metabolism and how that affects nerve regeneration. So this is back to uh, you know, basic science and looking at individual neurons. And as we learned earlier, we have these very long axons, incredibly long axons they grow out. I mean, when those can become injured or severed, uh, how can you facilitate the regrowth and recovery from that damage? Um, we do uh, very basic experiments looking at single cells. This is a single neuron that we've cut here with a, a high-powered laser, and we can watch that individual neuron regenerate over time. And if you think about it, if a neuron's injured and it has to recover and, and regrow, that's a highly energetic process. Um, the energy demands on that neuron are going to be way above the normal uh, energy needs of, of a functioning neuron. Um, and what we found is that we, we manipulate the cell metabolism that's going to uh, uh, give that energy source, we can actually enhance the outgrowth. So this is manipulating a, a GlickNAC signaling pathway, and ultimately it seems to affect cellular metabolism within the, the neuron itself uh, to get a, a, a substantial amount of additional outgrowth. So this is outgrowth of a typical neuron over 24 hours after uh, laser cutting, and we can almost double that in these uh, GlickNAC mutants. So our goal is really for our current projects are to really understand the, the cellular mechanisms, what's going on within the neuron to, to have this effect. How are we uh, affecting cellular metabolism? And then how is that enhancing nerve regeneration? So really the basic science, cell biology of that process. Um, and then to make initial steps at using pharmacological treatments to target these pathways as we learn about them, uh, to target and enhance outgrowth through uh, drug treatment. So in terms of the mechanism, we're using a genetic approach. So we, ha we have now this, these backgrounds where we have this great enhanced regeneration, and that really gives us a window into understanding what processes are involved. And so we are looking at differential gene expression, understanding which genes are overexpressed or underexpressed in those uh, backgrounds. And that gives us an idea about what mechanisms, right, what cellular mechanisms are involved. 
And so you can see here, we can classify the various genes with differential expression. Um, and a lot of them are involved in cell metabolism and energy usage within the cell. Um, I've just shown in one example here, once we identify them through this uh, uh, RNA-seq experiment, uh, we can go back and look at those genes, uh, manipulate them, and verify their effects on nerve regeneration, and therefore identify the, the processes that are involved in, in fundamental to really enhancing outgrowth uh, on the cellular level. Um, and then the second part of the project then, it, right, is to use uh, potential drugs to target these, these mechanisms, these pathways that we can identify, really trying to manipulate uh, cellular metabolism to be able to enhance uh, regrowth pharmacologically. And so you can see here, again, our single neuron uh, experiments, we've got a single axon we cut with a laser, but no treatment, we don't get much growth at all. Uh, we have a specific OGT inhibitor, so this is targeting this agglicnac signaling pathway. If we cut that axon, we get uh, almost immediate uh, growth prone uh, formation and outgrowth. So we can really enhance uh, the effects uh, and the regeneration through pharmacologically, uh, mimicking what we saw initially with genetic uh, manipulations. And so obviously the, the ultimate goal here is to push towards uh, therapeutic treatments identifying new, new therapeutic targets um, that are gonna enhance the recovery from uh, spinal cord injury and other sort of uh, neurological injuries. Um, yeah, I'll keep it quick here because we're, we're running out of time, um, but just to, uh, again, thank Dr. Ruby and, and everyone else for their, their efforts to help us pushing this uh, science forward and in, in the uh, therapeutic treatments to uh, the ultimate goal of uh, Massachusetts Walk again. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Gable. And to answer one of the questions that just came in, when my son first was injured 20 years ago, uh, we looked to say, when is there going to be a cure? And there are a number of different people looking to find the Holy Grail. Uh, if this were a simple problem, there would be a simple answer but the spinal cord is quite complex and all of the modalities are uh, very complex um, uh, to answer that question. Uh, I will say that uh, Massachusetts Walks Again now uh, has in its network uh, added the North American Spinal Cord Injury Consortium to the list of collaborators that we have. And if you go to our website, um, and you uh, find that, you will see that we are trying to uh, put together all of the different researchers um, on that site so that there is both um, uh, care and cure. Uh, David Estrada has been pushing very much that the research is what we really want to do uh, while he also is very involved in the uh, care part of it. Um, I will say that um, that was one of my announcements at the end, but I want to go right to the, um, um, and as part of the care, I should say also the second announcement was that the Greater Boston Chapter has eight virtual Zoom groups that are available uh, for joining, and that's per week. Um, and again, to please see their website for the details. Um, I want to say that, um, at the beginning of the program, I mentioned that I would be awarding uh, the um, uh, proclamation uh, to um, some of the, uh, the people who have helped me um, and also have done a, a significant amount of uh, work, um, uh, whose work and life exemplified service commitment and compassion to those with spinal cord injuries. And if you look at this um, uh, list, uh, you will see quite a few of the people who uh, actually have been on this program uh, listed. Uh, you will see the 2020 awardees are all members of the uh, Greater Boston Chapter of the United Spinal uh, Network, um, and here they are. Uh, Doug Fry, who is president, Dave Estrada, the vice president, Heather Wood, the chapter coordinator, and um, Ryan DeRoche, who actually is part of the digital media uh, coordination. 
So I really thank them very much. Um, and I want to give you a few uh, concluding comments, if I could. Um, Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Day is about networking, particularly between our researchers and those in the disability community. Uh, the legislators um, um, uh, who participate uh, in this talk uh, can observe the link between the theoretic and the, the reality. Uh, SCI Awareness Day is also about the scientific curiosity and the personal stories. And the traits actually in common for our grant recipients and for the paralyzed are creativity, innovation, persistence, passion, purpose, and courage. In our quest for a cure, we have gone from impossible to improbable to inevitable. Hope is an attitude. Research is our strategy. Funding makes it happen. Tomorrow we do envision a cure. Thank you to all the speakers and attendees who have shared your time, knowledge, and interest with us today. Not if, but when. Thank you.